show business today. A successful pop star, record company executive, producer, manager, and recognized throughout the world as one of the greatest... Oh, I'm sorry, I can't read your handwriting, Peter. One of the greatest things in the entire universe. Uh, humanitarian, blah de blah de blah de blah Grammys, blah de blah de blah Shag Marianne Faithful, I don't think so. Um, will you welcome, and welcome, please, tonight, Peter Asher. <laughs> Where's Gordon? He's dead. What? I'm afraid so, yes. He was the only one I liked. I knew I should have asked John Cleese to do it instead. Alright, let's try it again, please, boys, without the introduction. When I see her coming down the street I get so shaky and I feel so weak I tell my eyes look the other way But they don't seem to hear a word I say And I go to pieces that I want to hide Go to pieces that I almost die Every time my baby passes by Another love that will be true But they don't listen, they don't seem to care They reach for her, but she's not there And I go to pieces that I want to hide Go to pieces that I almost die Every time my baby passes by I remember what she said when she said goodbye Maybe we meet again too, maybe. But until we do, all the best to me, not so lonely without a home. Go to places we used to go, but I know she'll never show. She had me so much inside. Thank you very much, and, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm really thrilled to be invited to be part of this event. This is the first time I've ever been in the cavern. I've never played it before, I've never been here before, so it's, it's very exciting for me, and thank you. And in particular, out of curiosity, how many people here are actually from Liverpool? Mostly or not mostly? Or nobody? <laughs> Amazing. 
Because, I mean, I, I was just, it's, I was one back there. Right. Anyway, I was about to compliment your city, but you're not really here to be complimented. But, but it's such a cool city. I haven't been here for, for decades. And just wandering around the last couple of days, it's incredibly hip and interesting and looking great and great restaurants. And I'm really enjoying myself. Um, and thanks for asking me to come do this show. I know some of you may not have a very clear idea of what it is that you've come to exactly. You know, obviously I do some of the old songs, I've got a great band up here, I tell some stories and stuff and reminisce in general. A lot of the show, of course, is about great songs and great singers, and in particular the band we're all here because of, and we're going to talk about them. But that first song, oddly enough, is not a particularly Beatle-related song. That first song was by a songwriter who we mostly admire for his own hits, which were huge and which you'll know very well. That song was written by Del Shannon. And Exactly, hooray, a really great American song singer and songwriter. Yay! This is a picture of Dell that I took when we were all on the road together um, in, uh, in America. Of course, you know, which we'll talk about later, but so much of the so-called British invasion thing and the Beatles themselves was based on our admiration for American singers and American songs, and Dell was certainly someone we all admired very much. In this particular case, um, we were touring with Del Shannon and the Searchers uh, in Australia. And Dell had written this song, I Go To Pieces, and actually thought it would be great for the searchers. He offered it to them first, he went to their dressing room and played it to them. And incredibly, to my mind, they turned it down. I think they could have made a great record of it with their great jangly electric troll string sound. But they didn't. So when he came out, we were able to go, you know, excuse me, Mr. Shannon, we heard that song through the wall, it sounds great, would you mind if we recorded it? You'll actually find in the course of the show, I have kind of a habit of picking up orphan, unwanted songs, and, and they've been very good to us. But, so that's, that's how we got to record that song. Um, one of the things I get asked in America all the time, you know, is what made the 60s here in Britain so special? What made them unique? And why did it suddenly become so, so culturally and musically exciting and productive? And I think to understand that, we have to actually go back a decade. Because to me, what separated Britain from America so drastically began, of course, in the 50s. Because the 50s were a very, very dark and gloomy and, and black and white era. You know, theoretically, we'd won the war. Uh, when I'm in America, of course, I have to add, with some allies. But, but yeah. exactly. But really, we'd won it all by ourselves. Um, <laughs> So, we won the war, but it didn't feel that way, you know, and, and uh, there were bomb sites everywhere, London was a dark and dismal place, and of course, by the way, the, this, this darkness, the black and whiteness, wasn't just London, Liverpool was just as badly hit as anywhere else, I, I looked it up and discovered, you know, the bombing in Liverpool was at least as brutal as anything that London went through, so we were all living in a fairly depressed circumstance, that we had rationing, you know, we used to have little ration coupons to go down and get sweets at the sweet shop or any of that stuff. So, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a grim time. And I think when the 60s came around, everyone kind of went, look, we're, we're, somehow or other we're going to cheer ourselves up and get out of this mess. We did our best. You know, we, 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 crowned a, a, we had a big festival of Britain first in 1950 to try and cheer everybody up. Then we crowned a beautiful new queen. We declared it to be, you know, a new Elizabethan age and, and all that stuff. But to be honest, we had our doubts. Uh, we'd grown up, you know, we'd rather we'd been born in an era when Britain was supposed to rule the world, Britannia ruled the waves and all that stuff. But it was clear to us that Britain's position was changing and that the balance of power was changing. And if Britain wasn't going to be the center of the world anymore, we could clearly see where that center was going to be. We knew where the future lay. And of course it lay in America. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're here. We have an American here. Excellent. Um, uh, we could see that, you know, we looked across at this land, which to us seemed very magical. At that point in time, it seemed incredibly far away. Nobody nipped off to Florida for a week's holiday back then. America was far away and expensive. And we saw it in movies, we saw it in television. We saw this, this land where everybody had perfect teeth. You know, this land where. This, this land where everyone had huge refrigerators filled with exotic foods. You know, they had, they had giant amazing cars with huge fins on them. They had, they had giant amazing women with huge, you know, everything, everything about America just seemed... Oh, thank seemed, God. 
everything about America seemed big and, and more amazing. And of course, above all, we loved their music. I'll give you one example of how magic America seemed at the time. And this is a true story. When I was at school, somebody actually brought to school once a dollar bill, an actual dollar bill. We'd never seen one before in real life. We'd seen it in films and television. We took turns holding this dollar bill and it connected us to all these amazing cities like New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and New Orleans, all of which you knew about from films and all of which we knew about from their amazing music. Each of those cities had, had a whole school of music of its own, which we loved and admired. So therefore, it no, should be no surprise that, that the, the iconic band of the 60s began as a cover band. They began as a cover band for American music. Everybody did. Um, you know, they, they loved, their favorite songwriters were people like Chuck Berry and Smokey Robinson, Goffin and King. Lieber and Stoller, those were the ones that they admired, and those were the songs they, they performed. We all lived for, for American releases. In particular, um, we, were, we were big fans of American rhythm and blues. We, we thought it was the greatest music we'd ever heard. And, uh, we, and you know, to be honest, I actually thought at the time that we in Britain kind of understood and appreciated American rhythm and blues a bit more than they did in America with all deference to our American guests. And, and uh, for example, I mean, when I realized that we were all buying Little Richard's version of Tutti Frutti, and it was a big hit over here, and that was certainly the one I had in my record collection, and then we looked across the Atlantic and saw that number one in America was Pat Boone's record of Tutti Frutti, we started to think that maybe we were right, <laughs> that maybe we understood it better than they did. Uh, I was a big R&B fan. I used to go every Monday night uh, Ken Collier's Jazz Club off the Charing Cross Road on Monday night was Studio 54 and it was a, an R&B club, Studio 51, I mean, so I get a model up with the disco a couple of decades later. And where else I went? Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Studio 51, I used to go because they had a, a very good house band who played every Monday night um, for whom I forecast a, a bright future. Um, I used to see them every, every Monday. And, and then, of course, but they were doing, of course, songs of Muddy Waters and Bo Diddley, uh, Arthur Alexander, The Miracles. They weren't doing their own songs either. Um, the funny part was that, that only shortly after just being a fan and going to see them every Monday, uh, within less than a year, I actually ended up on the road with the Rolling Stones. We did a couple of tours together. We found this uh, poster from one tour uh, where we're playing the Rolling Stones and Peter and Gordon playing the town of Cannock, which has never been seen since. I've never heard of it. I don't know where it is. But evidently we found it and played a gig there. The Danilo Theatre in Cannock. Anybody ever, ever played there? No? No, I swear, nobody says it's, it's a one-off. Um, and then funnily enough, of course, Mick and I became friends and, and started hanging out together. And, and uh, this picture, the funny part about this picture is that neither Mick nor I can remember where we were going or why, but somehow we'd become, become part of what they called Swinging London, you know, and that was what, that was... Thank you. See, you've got a soundtrack with this show, that's how high our production values are. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, I'm going to tell a story, if I may, of, of what therefore began as a, as a homage to American music and American culture and America as a whole ended up changing British music completely and even changing the, you know, the resulting movement changed the social structure of Britain, the mood, the mood of Britain and everything else. I'll tell some of this story from a personal perspective if I may. I was 15 when the 60s began, living in a fairly upper class household in, in London. My father was a doctor, my mother was a professional musician, she was a classical oboe player and professor at the Royal Academy of Music up the road from my house. So you wouldn't have um, expected that I would necessarily have had a career ending up in show business. You'd think that I'd become a doctor like my dad or a proper musician like my mum and something like that. But actually there were clues that I might not take that kind of career path. Now, uh, I should have warned you at the beginning that this show also doesn't exactly quite stay on track all the time. Occasionally I'll take a, a kind of a 
kind of leap of faith into another area and, and jump back chronologically back and forth. So you'll have to bear with me, but I'll tie it all together into one story in the end if I can. Now this is one of those occasions, because I'm going to stop the narrative that I've started, if you'll forgive me, and indulge me, we're going to have a very short movie trivia quiz. There's always a stunned silence. And, but I'm going to play a very short clip from a very old black and white film. And the quiz is to see if anyone can identify the three lead actors. There's a husband, a wife, and their young son. And see if you can name all three. And if anyone gets it right, I have this fabulous box of chocolates for our winner. Well, exactly. So we'll see if anybody can win these chocolates. So pay attention, Cap, if you would. Let's dim the stage lights and everybody watch the screen for this little black and white movie clip. Did Daddy and Matt tomorrow morning everything? Yes, I will, darling. And tell Grandpa that Daddy's coming home on leave. Goodbye, Mike. Goodbye, Matt. Look after Mr. Mangles. Goodbye, Mike, old Jack. Keep your chin up. So, the hardest one to identify is the father, because he just comes in at the end. Anyone know who that was? Jack Hawkins. Jack Hawkins. We have a winner. And the mother? Claudine Colbert. Claudine Colbert is correct. And the young son is me, it's correct, it's a true question. So, so, I have to trust the crowd to pass these chocolates back to you, I hope they're not all bitten by the time you get them. I think it was between two people in there who got it right. But yes, I, st I began as a child actor when I was eight. Um, as you can see, I very much enjoyed kissing Claudette Colbert. Um, and it looks like a bit more than filial enthusiasm. Um, but, uh, I, so I acted quite a bit, I, if anybody remembers the old Robin Hood series, um, I was in a whole bunch of those. Uh, I was, uh, this one here, and I, I was Prince Arthur. See, very brave and handsome. Thank you. Now, actually, since we're in quiz mode, and since you're all Beatle fanatics, can anyone tell me the connection between that Robin Hood series and the Beatles? Dick James, tell us the story. Somebody knew. The connection is Dick James. Dick James, as you probably all know, was the Beatles publisher. He was also the man who sang Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Riding Through the Glen on the TV show. So that's a piece of trivia you didn't know. I'm not. So you learned something at least. That's great. Um, so anyway, when I went to this, my acting career kind of drifted to a, to a halt when I went to school, because I had to start taking school seriously. I went to Westminster in London, which as you probably know is quite serious and they don't let you off to, to act or, or anything else. When I do this in America, I have to explain what a public school is, but at least I don't here. Yeah. Um, when I was at Westminster, I was a, still a big music fan. I was primarily a, a jazz fan. I was a bebop fan. I, I loved the music of, of Charlie Parker and, and Miles Davis. And, and, all those people, Thelonious Monk, Kenny Clark, that's what I listened to. But I knew that I was never going to be a good enough musician to play it. To play that stuff, you've really got to practice all the time, and I was far too lazy. And, and uh, I didn't. But the other music I loved was American folk music. I listened a lot to Woody Guthrie, to Lead Belly, Cisco Houston, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and all that stuff. And I learned all those songs. And those songs, I could at least learn to play. They were like three or four chord songs. I'd already got a guitar at this point, taught myself a few chords. And I'm not saying I could play any of, of it well. Clearly the idea of a weedy English public schoolboy playing lead belly is pathetic on the very face of it. But, but at least I could learn the songs and I enjoyed singing them. And while I was doing so, while I was at Westminster, I met another pupil who also played the guitar and sang. And his name was Gordon Waller. Now, and he was a terrific singer. He was, at the time, more of a rock fan than I was. He was a big Eddie Cochran fan, a Buddy Holly fan, and of course a huge Elvis fan. You could tell he was going for a bit of the Elvis look as best he could. And, uh, and Gordon and I started playing and singing together, just out of curiosity really, to see what it sounded like because we both enjoyed doing it. And people liked it, and they asked us to come play at their parties and things like that, and, and we did. It was, we enjoyed it and we discovered that 
the legendary cliche that for some reason being able to sit down and sing a song and play a guitar is occasionally attractive to girls, which is why we kept practicing. And, and uh, so we were doing all that, and eventually we actually got some, some paid gigs. People would ask us to come and, and they'd offer us a few pounds. Then we started playing pubs where they'd give us a pound. We did a pub at lunchtime where we got a pound each and free beer, which was a fantastic deal when you were at school, and, um, and so on. Now, of course, as Gordon and I got together, I would teach him some folk songs, he would teach me some rock and roll songs, but where we coincided and, and where we found ourselves in complete agreement, and indeed the group that every duo throughout history has looked up to as the best of all time, we were big fans of the Everly Brothers. Every, every duo from us to John and Paul to, to Simon and Garfunkel, you name it, they all revere the Everly. So we did quite a number of, of Everly songs in our set. And in their honor, I'd like to do a, an Everly Brothers song for you now. Uh, this is a, a great Everly song, but it's special in another way as well. <coughs> The reason it's special, as I told you, we, we used to look very carefully at the names under all these songs on the records we bought. All the writers, we didn't know really who they were, we, we were very interested in the names. And one of the names that kept occurring under so many great songs was the name King. Now we didn't know who this mysterious Mr. King was, but Goffin and King of course wrote Chains that the Beatles did, they wrote Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, and they wrote I'm Into Something Good, and all this stuff, and they also, King also wrote this great Everly Brothers song, Crying in the Rain, and of course it wasn't until later that I discovered the King of Goffin and King was none other than Carol King, who some years later I went on to work with and produce and manage and, and, and so on, and became a great friend. Back then, she was just a mysterious name on a label. So in honor of the Everly's, we're going to do this uh, Everly song, Carol King song. I did get to see Don Everly not long ago, so I do have a picture of, of me and Don. So I, I, I got to be an honorary Everly brother for all of 10 seconds. Um, and it was very exciting. He's one of my heroes. So in his honor, and, and in honor of Carol too, we'll do Crying in the Rain. Two, three, and... I'll do my crying in the rain. 